on the night of December 18th, 2006, a family of five, two parents and three daughters from Augusta, Georgia would stop at a convenience store in South Carolina during a road trip. The stop was meant to be quick, and so the parents would leave their daughters in the parked car just outside the building while they went inside. While this was taking place, John Barton, a 55-year-old man dressed as Santa Claus and driving a motorcycle with an attached sidecar had pulled in to fill up with gas. Noticing the three children alone in the parked car, the man dressed as Santa would give them a hand signal to come over to him. The oldest of the girls, who was only eight years old, would unlock the car from the inside and walk over to the man who she believed was Santa Claus. Her two younger sisters would not be far behind. John Barton explained to the girls how he wanted to show them his stuffed reindeer in his attached sidecar. He then convinced the oldest girl to get inside, where he would then drive off back onto the highway. Upon seeing the girls standing in the parking lot, their father, Trip Morris, would run to his car and chase the motorcycle. Meanwhile, the mother would stay back with the two remaining daughters and call the police. The pursuit of the father and the man dressed as Santa would last multiple minutes. At times, the two would reach speeds of 80 miles per hour. All the while, the father would repeatedly flash his headlights. After some time, John Barton would seemingly give up and pull into a church parking lot where Trip Morris was able to confront him and recover his uninjured daughter. John Barton would flee the scene, but later be found by police hiding in a utility room at a nearby bar, still dressed as Santa Claus. John Barton would then be arrested, and he would later be charged with kidnapping. In 2011, a Redditor would upload this disturbing occurrence he experienced as a child. The day was December 23rd, 1985. The original poster and his parents were staying with his grandmother in the San Francisco Bay Area for Christmas. And being that it was only two days from Christmas Day, the family suggested going to the nearest mall, Sun Valley, to get Christmas pictures with the mall Santa. Come around 7.30 of that night and the family was set to leave. However, just before they would leave the house, the grandmother would claim to have gotten an overwhelming feeling of dread. She didn't want to go and this caused the whole family to reluctantly come to the decision that they would just stay home. Later that night, at 8.35 p.m., an inbound plane headed for the nearby airport Buchanan Field would miss its target due to weather and strike the Sun Valley Mall. The plane shot clean through the Macy's department store, bursting into flames and leaving a 50-foot-long hole in the roof. Wreckage and debris were scattered all across the rooftop and into the mall below a mall that contained thousands of last-minute Christmas shoppers, as well as children and their parents waiting in line to see the mall's Santa, the same line that the Redditor and his family had planned to be in. At the time of the crash, no one knew exactly what had just happened. Some thought an explosive was detonated. Others thought it was an earthquake. The scene was one of absolute chaos. The building was filled with smoke and soot, those who weren't injured were desperately using the water from the mall's fountain and ice from refrigerators to treat burns of the injured. Unfortunately, the three aboard the plane were instantly killed upon impact. On the ground, a total of 79 people would be injured, and sadly, four would lose their lives. Following the incident, multiple lawsuits would be filed on the base that an airport should not have been allowed to be built so close to a shopping mall. However, to this day, both the Buchanan Field Airport and the Sun Valley Shopping Mall are still in the same locations and fully operational. On the morning of December 23, 1974, at the Seminary South Shopping Center in Fort Worth, Texas, two girls had plans to go Christmas shopping. The first, Rachel Trelisa, age 17. The second, Renee Wilson, age 14. Just before they were going to leave, nine-year-old Julianne Mosley would ask to tag along, which the older girls would allow. The three would end up leaving a little before noon. Their plan was to be back home by 4 p.m. at the latest. However, 4 p.m. came and went, and there was no sign of them. It wasn't until around 6 p.m. that the families of the girls started getting concerned. It was around this time that the parents decided to head to the shopping mall themselves. They would find the girl's car parked in an upper-level parking lot filled with recently purchased Christmas gifts, but the girls themselves were nowhere to be found. Immediately upon the discovery, the parents would call the police and file three missing person reports. The police originally believed the girls ran away. 
exactly one day after their disappearance, Rachel's family would receive a letter that read, I know I'm going to catch it, but we just had to get away. We're going to Houston. See you in about a week. The car is in the Sears upper lot. Love, Rachel. However, the families of the girls were not convinced. For one, the families all claimed that none of the girls had shown any signs of wanting to run away leading up to the disappearance. And two, the letter supposedly written by Rachel had originally misspelled the word Rachel. It was first written with an E, but then written over with an L, the correct way to spell it. Rachel's family finds it highly unlikely that Rachel would misspell her own name. Ever since that day, December 23rd, 1974, none of the three girls have been found. The letter that showed up the next day on Christmas Eve was the last piece of evidence ever discovered. Therefore, it's unclear what happened to the three girls. The case has been dubbed the Fort Worth Missing Trio. In the early morning of December 9, 2009, a 12-year-old kid in Parma, Ohio had been making her way to school. The route was one she walked every morning without incident. However, this morning in particular would be different. As she was walking up to an intersection, a man dressed in a pretty convincing Santa Claus costume would reveal himself from a set of nearby bushes. The man's costume was complete with boots, a belt, a hat, a white beard, and of course the red suit itself. The man would attempt to lure the kid towards him, but startled by the man, she would avoid him and without saying anything, continued walking right past him. This would cause the man to step out of the bushes and follow the girl. The man would then attempt to grab the girl on multiple occasions, but after much resistance, he was unsuccessful and would flee the scene on a public bus. The girl would then enter a nearby store and explain to the owner what had just taken place. The police would immediately be called. The man dressed as Santa, later identified to be a man named Anthony Russo, would be found and arrested carrying a sack and a large box of candy canes. Anthony, along with his suit, would be taken directly to the Parma Police Department. Patty Vaughn was a 32-year-old from San Antonio, Texas. She was a wife to a man named Jerry Vaughn and had three children. Relatively speaking, her life was pretty average. However, this would all change on Christmas Day of 1996. On this day, Patty would randomly disappear out of nowhere, leaving behind her whole family. But by looking into the case further, the disappearance starts to look less and less random. In the months leading up to her disappearance, Patty and Jerry Vaughn would begin a six month trial separation as their marriage was beginning to fall apart. During this time, Jerry would move into his own apartment nearby. Despite this, the two would decide to spend Christmas Day together with their three kids. However, Jerry would later state that by 6.30 p.m. that night, the two would break out in a huge argument. And this would later be confirmed, as one of Patty's sisters who lived out of state would call her to wish her Merry Christmas, but be met with a crying and distraught Patty. Following the argument, Jerry would report Patty to have stormed out of the house and into her minivan, which she would drive off in. This would be the last time Patty Vaughn would ever be seen again. The next day, on December 26th, after not being able to reach her, one of Patty's cousins filed a missing person report with the local sheriff's office. And on that same day, Patty's minivan would be found abandoned on the side of the highway with a flat tire. Disturbingly, inside the van were small traces of blood. This blood would later be confirmed to belong to Patty. The carpets inside the van had been heavily cleaned with shampoo. Patty, along with her keys and purse, would never be recovered in the investigation. The number one suspect in the case was of course Patty's husband, Jerry. Although, Jerry would profusely state that he had nothing to do with the disappearance, and not enough evidence was ever found to say otherwise. As of yet, no one has been charged with the disappearance, and it's still unclear what exactly happened to Patty Vaughn, or where she is now.